Okay, so it is really great pleasure to have Patrick Hayden from Stanford, and he will tell us about canonical definition of energy in open quantum systems. Please start. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to speak today about work with John Source uh, that was published this year, although it was done, I think it was the first project he did as a PhD student, and he's applying for postdocs this year. And so it's a little bit, a little bit old, but still, uh, still fun. And I think he's on the, um, he's present today. And so if I make any mistakes, John, don't hesitate to correct me, and he may pipe up with, uh, with further comments. The, the topic, which might not sound like it's terribly immediately, like it's immediately terribly related to the topic of the workshop, but I'm going to try to bring them together, is that we're going to be coming up with a canonical definition for energy in open quantum systems. And the motivation for this work, I'll tell you what it, yeah, we're, we're going to get to the point of what that means and why it's an issue, but it came from this paper by Cesar Agon, Vijay Balasubramanian, uh, Schuyler, Casco and Albion Lawrence. It was published in 2018, but it was published, you know, it was originally written in 2014. So that's the time scale things that were happening. Um, and they were interested in coarse grain quantum dynamics. And their motivation is that they wanted to understand the evolution of infrared degrees of freedom in a conformal field theory uh, as an open quantum system, because they wanted to study the entanglement between the IR and the UV uh, because of this general uh, intuition that uh, the bulk in ADS-CFT is somehow related to the IR degrees of freedom, and uh, degrees of freedom in the bulk closer to the boundary are, are, are related to the UV. Um, and traditional textbook approaches to renormalization, as they point out, um, manually disentangle the infrared and UV degrees of freedom. Um, they're kind of obscuring the the relationship that is actually in many in many ways very important to the uh, to the dynamics and and structure of ADS CFT and so that was their motivation for studying this question and in their paper they did a number of nice things but um, it was structured around a few different examples uh, including a you know some coupled spins coupled harmonic oscillators and a, a phi cubed uh, scalar field theory um, and derived what are called master equations for the open system evolution. And so a master equation, an, an example of such a thing, and the form that we're going to be looking at in this talk, is that we're interested in the dynamics of the reduced density operator for, in this case, say, the infrared degrees of freedom. Um, and we try to write it in a form that has, say, some renormalized Hamiltonian um, acting unitarily, plus some dissipative piece. And in many circumstances, um, one would hope that the dissipated piece would be would be small, or perhaps if you were looking at UV IR and you went to you know sufficiently UV degrees of freedom, perhaps you could even ignore the dissipated piece. Um, but we're going to be working in a regime in which you you can't ignore it generally. Um, and we want to understand uh, how to interpret this equation. And so I'll start off by just setting up the formal uh, you know, the formal problem. Uh, and then we'll start to analyze it. So we're going to have a bipartite Hilbert, uh, Hilbert space. So there's an A part. So we can think of some A degrees of freedom and some B degrees of freedom. And then there's a Hamiltonian for the A degrees of freedom, uh, at, you know, um, which acts only on the, the Hilbert space, a Hamiltonian for the B degrees of freedom. And then there's an interaction Hamiltonian that couples them. And so formally, the Hamiltonian has the form A Hamiltonian tensored with the identity uh, on the B system, plus the identity on the A system tensored with the B Hamiltonian, plus the interaction Hamiltonian. And we're going to do something which in some ways violates the, um, the motivation, but it, you'll see it's, it's not as strong a, a violation as one would think. We're going to assume that there's a factorized initial state. Um, so the initial state is going to be a state on the A system tensored with a state on the B system. And then we're going to consider the open system evolution. Now, if we have some density operator and it evolves according to a Hamiltonian, and we've written down a Hamiltonian, then um, the density operator just gets conjugated by the exponentiated Hamiltonian. That's well known. 
and uh, familiar. And so we're, if we're interested in only the density operator of the A system, then we should just take this density operator for the full system and trace over B. And that gives us the time, you know, the open system time evolution. Um, and notice that because we assumed a factorized initial state, um, if we just trace over B here, this is a linear map that depends on time acting on the initial system, uh, the initial state on, of the A system. And in fact, it's a quantum channel, um, a completely positive trace preserving map, because if you started off as a density operator, you will always remain a density operator. And so this is a, that's the structure of the problem. We're, we're trying to figure out what this, uh, what this quantum channel is. And it's, you know, what we'll want to do is write down a differential equation for the channel. And so if we differentiate the, uh, this equation, on the right-hand side, the only uh, quantity or the only object that depends on time is the quantum channel. And so the time derivative is just the, we just differentiate uh, the quantum channel. But we really want this to be a differential equation expressed in terms of the state at a given time t. And so um, I, if I have the state at time t and I want to map it to the state at time zero, I have to take the channel and invert it. And then I have the time derivative. So that's just an identity. And we can do that provided uh, this channel is invertible. Um, and so I'll call this, uh, this composition of the time derivative of the channel with the inverse of the channel, uh, the generator, the Lindbladian, um, after Goran Lindblad, who was one of the first people to start you know, to study these kinds of equations. Um, so my generator L sub t um, has this form. So that's a pretty simple derivation. But a point that I want to make is that it, Never did I make any assumption about Markovianity in this system. That usually, uh, in most, if you've ever seen a paper um, in, that uses one of these master equations, 97% of the time, um, the equation is derived under an assumption of Markovianity. Um, and this is actually an exact equation. There's no approximation here. Um, this is an exact equation for the evolution of the density operator. Um, Patrick, question? Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe something you're going to talk about, but I mean, um, uh, since n depends on row b, yeah, wouldn't wouldn't it be kind of um, surprising if it was invertible? Ah, okay. Well, uh, so n depends on row b at time zero. Yeah. Um, not on row b as a function of time. So n is um, acting on. If we think of the space of um, density matrices, yeah. I guess it, it's it's acting. Um, it, it's giving you a, a density matrix which is the same size as the density matrix at the input. So at exactly. least it has a chance of being invertible. Yeah, I, I guess I'm and just actually, wondering: is it generically invertible or? Well, what in finite dimensions, um, it's not too hard to argue that there will just be a, an isolated set of points at which NT is not invertible. And so you're guaranteed to have some, uh, some open interval um, during which this equation is applicable. And I'm going to give an example that will perhaps clarify uh, what's happening. So actually, okay. that's where I'm going right now. Um, so let's think about a simple example where our Hamiltonian of the AB system is the swap. Right, so like the, um, if you're thinking qubits, you know, just the, the Heisenberg exchange interaction uh, would be an example where the, the Hamiltonian is basically the swap. And we'll start out, we'll just talk about a qubit if you like. Um, the row B system, let's make it maximally mixed to begin with. And my picture here is the block sphere. So the north and south poles are spin up, spin down, and then the eigenstates of sigma X and on the left and the right. And the maximally mixed state is at the center. And I could have some initial state, let's say it's pure, uh, row A0 um, sitting on the surface of the block sphere. Now, as I evolve, um, what the open system evolution does here is it just takes me on a straight line from my initial state to the maximally mixed state. That the, the channel that, uh, that 
that is induced here is just depolarization. It's just shrinking the block sphere as a function of time. Um, and it's pretty, you know, as a, as a linear transformation, this is clearly invertible. Uh, um, if I have some finite amount of shrinking, all I have to do is by, you know, I, I, uh, I, I rescale by the inverse of the shrinking um, and I'll get back to where I started. And so this evolution, um, for this evolution, NT is going to be invertible until you actually evolve for time pi by two and have fully swapped the A and the B systems, at which, at which point the A system is maximally mixed and no longer has any memory of what the initial state was. And, and that's where the, that, that's the point at which this, uh, um, this uh, equation is going to break down. Um, of course, you could you restart. the Hamiltonian in terms of the Kits and the Bras? Um, you want me to write the Hamiltonian? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. So let's see. I'm going to be a sum over I. So let's see. I want to and J. I, J, A, and B, J, I, A, and B. There's my Hamiltonian. What are I and J? Uh, an orthonormal basis. Uh, I is an orthonormal basis for A, and J is an orthonormal um, On the left, uh, here, I'll even expand it a little bit more here. So that, that's what my shorthand meant. So I have an orthonormal basis for the A's and an orthonormal basis for the B's. Uh, and this is the swap. Uh, why does it swap? <laughs> um, if you don't mind, I, I'm happy to take that offline. Okay, um, but, but you can see if, if, a, uh, if an I state comes in on B, it gets moved to a, an I state on A by this transformation. Um, but I, I'm happy to take this offline, but... Uh, Oh, I mean, an, another, you know, another Hamiltonian that will do this is sigma x tensor sigma x plus sigma y tensor sigma y plus sigma z tensor sigma z up to a sign that I might have gotten wrong there. Um, but I think that's right. Uh, so a, a standard Heisenberg, uh, Heisenberg interaction will all, is actually a, the same thing as this. And what is your commutator with the, uh, with the rho b, with the rho a? What is the commutator? Because you want oh. the commutator to get the evolution, right? Yes. So I, if you don't mind, I'm not going to okay. work out exactly what the evolution here is on, on the spot. Um, but I mean, the easiest way to figure out the evolution is just to exponentiate the swap operator. Um, and then what you're going to get is the cosine of time times the identity plus i times the sine of time times the swap. And so at time pi by 2, it's a, it's a swap. Yeah, so that's a that's an example um, that I think illustrates how this equation can be exact, and also you know, illustrates how it's going to break down eventually. And just another example, like a, the common kind of application for these kinds of equations, um, it doesn't have to be an exact equation. It can be an approximation. So you could be talking, say, about photon emission into a zero temperature reservoir uh, for some harmonic oscillator. And in that case, there's some dissipation, which corresponds to you know, emitting a, a photon. So you jump down an energy level in the harmonic oscillator. And the equation will have the form something like um, Hamiltonian evolution with the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, and then some dissipator part that I'll call D, you know, the script D here. Um, and it's, there's going to be a term in the dissipator that looks like a rho a dagger for the annihilator, uh, uh, the annihilation operator a, and that's the the term that actually is responsible for this dissipation, where you would hop down one level in the harmonic oscillator. This piece here is basically just present to make sure that the the trace of the density operator doesn't yeah is preserved as a function of time. And we're going to see equations of this type as we go along. Okay. So what is the conceptual problem that we're trying to deal with here? It's that if we're given a generator of the open system time evolution, this is a well-defined object. It, you know, it, it describes how the density operator uh, changes as a function of time. 
we could take any Hamiltonian, including you know, ham, you know, time and time dependent Hamiltonians on A, and just define the dissipator in the following way. We take the original generator, we add in conjugation with the Hamiltonian. And then just by definition, uh, I've constructed a situation where my uh, my Lin Bladian, my generator, has the form we we're commuting with this Hamiltonian, and then we're adding the dissipator. And so the Hamiltonian can literally be anything you want it to be, right? Like at this point, um, there's just no there's no principle, there's no mean, you know, there's there's no meaning to the Hamiltonian. It's just you know, it's just whatever you want it to be. Um, and so when we read uh, the Aegon et al. paper, this was a source of confusion for us. There was, you know, there was, they were deriving a Hamiltonian, but in this formalism, the Hamiltonian is just not a well-defined object. And we thought that this was just our own confusion. We were trying to sort it out. Uh, unknown to us, this, was a this is a source of great confusion and debate uh, in the literature on open quantum systems. And we only learned that after we published our paper, um, but it's quite current at the moment because there are a number of people motivated by thinking about mesoscopic quantum systems or you know like small quantum systems uh, coupled to relatively small baths potentially strongly they want to think about these systems thermodynamically but they they're going to have you know because of this strong coupling they have to you know be careful about what they mean by energy and uh, of a local subsystem and so on and here are just a sampling of papers from the past year or so not at all, you know, like there are dozens of them with conflicting proposals for what you should do. Um, and, you know, some people say you should just take the bare Hamiltonian of the A system. Some say you should include the interaction energy. Some have some somewhat ad hoc prescription for renormalizing the Hamiltonian. You may not get terribly different answers in the examples they're thinking about as long as you're at weak coupling, but at strong coupling, you're, you're going to get very different answers. In fact, some of the prescriptions that people are putting out there aren't even internally consistent um, because they start defining quantities like free energies and uh, the amount of work uh, performed on the environment, et cetera. Uh, and internally, the, it just doesn't make sense. And so it's, it, it turns out that the, you know, there's a need for a principled and unambiguous definition of what the subsystem energy is. And so that's what we're going to do. And after we published our paper, in fact, again, I said we were completely ignorant of this, but uh, people who are working uh, in the um, quantum th thermodynamics uh, community, open systems, um, they used the prescription that we provided uh, to provide at least one internally consistent, physically principled answer to how you would define a strong coupling quantum thermodynamics. Um, and so our, the, our hey, physical principle, yeah. Well, maybe you're, you're about to address this, but what is, what do you need this for? Like what? what why, why does would it someone want this? Yeah. Um, well, why does it matter? Have, why, does, why does it matter? Well, thermodynamic reasoning is powerful, right? If you, you're able to talk about free energy, uh, that places constraints on the transformations that you're going to be able to realize. If you can talk about work done on the bath, you know, like the, there are going to be thermodynamic relationships that you can derive. And that, that's basically why they want to be able to do it, um, be able to, to draw conclusions about the behavior of the system um, at a level that might not require a detailed microscopic understanding of everything that's happening in their bath. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I see. Yeah. And so our approach, I think it makes sense, is just to make the dissipator as small as possible, right? Um, that if you want to separate the system into Hamiltonian evolution and uh, dissipative evolution, and you want to sit, you know, you want to extract what you think of as the intrinsically Hamiltonian part, uh, just make the dissipator as small as you can. Um, and once you've done that, the Hamiltonian, um, let's call it the renormalized Hamiltonian, is then fixed because you just subtract the dissipator from the, uh, from the generator and you're left with the Hamiltonian time evolution. Um, and of course, what I've said right there is not well defined yet. I, don't, I haven't told you what I mean by small, um, but, and I will do that. There are some unexpected bonus features um, that come out of the prescription that we make, um, which is that it actually retroactively justifies many of the common choices that have been made historically. And they've been made for convenience, they've made for aesthetic reasons, they've been made based on physical intuition. 
Uh, but it turns out what people just kind of in an ad hoc way have written down is consistent with this prescription and therefore actually uh, gives you this kind of canonical definition of a Hamiltonian dissipator um, in many circumstances. And that goes all the way back to Lindblad's original paper in 1976. He just um, mathematically um, De, you know, extracted a Hamiltonian um, with no physical justification whatsoever, uh, but it turns out that his Hamiltonian is the same one that we're going to propose today. Um, yeah. So wh why is it clear that uh, this smallness doesn't depend on how long you time evolve for? Um, we're going to be speaking about the smallness of the dissipator itself. So I'll, I'll give you a definition. So instantaneously, the dis we want the dissipator to be small. Okay, um, time by time, somehow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the dissipator is really only defined in the is is a is a part of the generator. It's not a part of the integrated evolution. Good. Right. That okay. the that you're thinking of the, the generator is having some Hamiltonian part and some other stuff that can't be described as um, commuting with the Hamiltonian. So, oh, yeah. Another question. Hey, Jonathan. Hi, Patrick. I'm not sure if this is maybe more appropriate for after or, or now, but I guess this thing won't be conserved, will it? Or this um, your definition? Uh, like... No, um, no. The, the Hamiltonian need not be conserved. Like the energy need not be conserved. And so maybe this is for the, for the discussion after. But I guess if given that we, you know, why why should we expect a canonical definition of um, energy <laughs> if it's not conserved? Like if it's not usually, well, well, well no, yeah. If, like usually, we, we would say, oh, we would use no theorem. We would say, okay, there's this conserved quantity, um, which is a which has some, you know, this conserved charge. But given that it's not, why even try and look for such a thing? Um. So. But and it's not the generate. Yeah, it's not so generating it's, your time evolution. Like it's generating a part of your time evolution. Right. Um, why not take the whole generator? Like, why not take the, you know, in the, in the doubled? I mean, maybe, maybe I should stop. Yeah. But okay. Let, let, yeah. Let's take it offline yeah. just okay. so I can get through. But I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay. So, um, to figure out or to define what we mean by small, we just have to identify the basic properties of this generator. Um, it's hermeticity preserving um, because this uh, time evolution has to send density operators to density operators. And for the same reason, it's trace annihilating, because the original density operator had trace one, um, and any perturbation you give to it should be traceless in order to stay in the trace one subspace. And so we can define a vector space, which I'll call QME quantum master equation vector space, which is just the set of generators, and it's a real vector space. Um, and it has a subspace that we're interested in, which is a subspace of Hamiltonian evolutions, where we're actually commuting with some Hamiltonian. So what I mean here, uh, Ham is you know, the union of, uh, of such things over all Hamiltonians H. Now, how do you measure size? This thing is traceless. So if you input a state uh, and you act on it by uh, some potential generator, you know, the trace is always zero. So that's not a good way. Um, so we should look at something at least quadratic in the input ge uh, generator. And I'm going to give you a few proposals here. So one proposal might be to say, all right, well, let's take the average size over choices of input states and measurements we could perform. And so what's that going to look like? I'm going to integrate over projections onto some final state C of um, the generator acting on some input state psi. Oops, it didn't come out properly. Times itself. Um, and then the C again. And that gives me some notion of size of this generator, which is averaged over all, uh, all potential input states to the space. So it's, it's isotropic and isn't, un, isn't biased towards some particular direction in the output. Um, another option would be to take the size of the choi Jamilkowski state. Um, so what you do there is you have, a, if, you're, if you're given a generator phi, um, you could act on it by, on half of a maximally entangled state. So I could take 
phi tensored with the identity, act on half of maximally entangled state. And then I could look at the size of that um, in this Hilbert Schmidt sense. So, um, sorry, choi of phi, choi of phi. And you know, I'm just uh, compelled to put daggers on here. Um, so it's just ob you know, obviously positive semi-definite, um, but these operators are all Hermitian. And so the daggers are redundant. I mean, a third, op a third op option would be to take the super operator Hilbert Schmidt uh, norm. And so for my phi, I take the trace of super operator phi adjoint. So this is the adjoint is a super operator. The super operators are generally not a self-adjoint. Um, composed with phi. And so this is a trace over an operator basis um, for these super operators. And um, there's no great coincidence happening. These are, in fact, different norms, not just different up to some scalar multiplication, but they just measure, you know, they, they are not multiples of each other. They're, they're, uh, they measure size differently. And I don't have a particularly good reason to choose one over the other. Uh, the third one is perhaps nicer, nicest mathematically. The first one might be the best physically motivated. Um, the second one is maybe somewhere in between. Um, but there's good news, which is in fact, they all induce the same effect of Hamiltonian. And so it doesn't matter which one of these I choose. Um, they're all going to give me the same answer. That if I minimize, you know, I define the dissipator uh, in such a way that I minimize uh, this quantity, then that's how, I'm, that's how I'm going to win, or I'm going to get the same answer in all three cases. And why is that? Or you know, how do we figure this out? Well, this space of quantum master equations isn't just a vector space, it's an inner product space with the inner products associated for, to each of these norms. That these were Each of these norms were defined, or the norm squares were quadratic functions. And pretty obviously, if I just didn't use the same channel in both cases, or the same um, the same map phi in both cases, but made it bilinear instead of quadratic, then I get inner products out of the same formulas. And so I can turn the space of quantum master, the space of quantum master equations into an inner product space. And there's a subspace in that inner product space, which is the Hamiltonian superoperators that correspond to commuting with the Hamiltonian. And then there's the orthogonal complement to that with respect to whichever inner product I choose. And if I have a particular super operator, a uh, potential generator, which I've, I've called phi here, then with respect to that inner product, I can decompose it um, orthogonally. And so I'll have what I'll call a, a Hamiltonian super operator with my canonical Hamiltonian in the Hamiltonian subspace. And then I'll have, do I have room for it? D canonical, the canonical dissipator, um, which is the uh, in the orthogonal complement. And so just a little more formally, um, I'm projecting phi onto uh, the Hamiltonian subspace and its orthogonal complement. So I'm writing phi as projection phi plus you know, projection onto the orthogonal complement phi. And the first one is my Hamiltonian super operator, which is commuting with a canonical, what I'm going to call now my canonical Hamiltonian. And the other one is my canonical dissipator. And now my canonical dissipator is going to be minimal among all decompositions into the Hamiltonian subspace and something that's not in the Hamiltonian subspace. And so if I decompose my, my phi as commutation with some other Hamiltonian plus the associated dissipator, what's that going to look like in this picture? Well, my dissipate, the other dissipator is going to be one of these non-orthogonal projections um, uh, in the gray line. And the length of that dissipator is minimized when I do the orthogonal projection. And so it's just you know, immediate from uh, inner product space geometry that if we construct the canonical Hamiltonian and the canonical dissipator using orthogonal projection, then we're going to get, uh, then the dissipator part is going to be minimal. So that's what we do. And 
Of course, this is just a very abstract prescription in terms of these different uh, these different inner products. But you can you know you can start calculating with them and try to figure out what the canonical Hamiltonian is going to be. And well, how do you how do you project onto some subspace orthogonally? You can choose an ortho orthonormal basis for that subspace, so an orthonormal basis for the Hamiltonian subspace, which I'll write as um, which will actually involve a, an orthogonal basis of Hamiltonian operators or uh, of Hamiltonians. And so there's my, what my projection looks like. And then we just have to calculate this thing. And I gave you three options for the inner product. The first one involved integration um, over some unitarily invariant set of states, uh, two such integrations. And so the first one's going to involve evaluating some Haar integrals. The second one's just involve appropriate tensor contractions. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the details. I'll just tell you what the answer looks like in terms of tensors. And the, the picture that I'm going to draw, um, the notation I'm going to have here, I'm going to, a density operator rho is an element of a Hilbert space and its dual. So the arrow coming out is the Hilbert space. The arrow coming in is the dual. And so a super operator is going to have two arrows coming in and two arrows going out because it has a density operator coming in and a density operator going out. And if we use the convention that the, the way one of these super operator acts on a density operator is by connecting, oops, connecting the legs as so, out to in, out to in. Um, this takes, you know, th this is a linear transformation that takes a density operator and gives me back a density operator. Or actually, it doesn't take, gives me a, a, hermis a hermitian operator, a perturbation to a density operator. And in that notation, um, once you do the calculation, I can just show you what the canonical uh, Hamiltonian is going to look like. Um, there are going to be two terms subtracted from each other. And that makes sense because the canonical Hamiltonian uh, involves a commutator, right? So there, you're, you're going to be subtracting two things. And in one term, you contract the indices on the left of the superoperator. And the other, you contract the indices on the right. And there's a prefactor. 2i, that's not too interesting. Um, but there's also the dimension of the Hilbert space, which is annoying. And I forgot to mention it, but um, what I'm doing at this point, and this is you know, unfortunate, but uh, required, um, requires the assumption of finite dimensionality, um, at least because we, you know, we did this integration over the Haar measure. Um, and I think it, even the prescription is only properly motivated in finite dimensions where it makes sense to treat the whole Hilbert space isotropically. Um, that physically, that doesn't really make sense once you go to an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, you would want to impose some, uh, some en energy constraint or something more subtle than that. But there's the formula for the canonical Hamiltonian. And I want to emphasize, this is a very simple formula. Right, so these definitions that I wrote down potentially look complicated. Initially, when we said we're going to minimize dissipation, you might have worried. You wor might have worried. Well, that's an abstract prescription that you're never going to be able to work with. But the the actual formula is very simple to calculate the effective Hamiltonian. And I'll even write it out a little bit more explicitly now. So, a generator L is a hermeticity preserving superoperator, and every such superoperator has what's called a pseudo Krauss decomposition. So you sum, um, and there's some coefficients gamma j, and then you conjugate rho by some operators ej. And if you're familiar with quantum channels, um, every quantum channel, which is a completely positive uh, trait, or so let's just say any completely positive uh, um, linear map, will have the same form and won't even need these gamma coefficients. In the, her in the hermeticity preserving case, you have those coefficients. And in general, all you know is that they're real. <coughs> so they can be positive or they can be negative. And then evaluating this formula for the canonical Hamiltonian um, just amounts to summing with the trace, um, oh, I should say there's gammas. So the trace of EJ, EJ dagger, that's the left contraction, give me a trace of EJ. And then the right contraction is ultimately give me, going to give me a trace of EJ dagger, EJ. So if I, write, if I have a pseudo Krauss decomposition for L, there's the simple formula for the canonical Hamiltonian. 
And given the canonical Hamiltonian, I can calculate the canonical dissipator. I just remove the uh, canonical, canonical Hamiltonian from the, uh, from the Lindbladian. And if you plug in the formulas, that's what it's look like, it looks like. And you don't need to you know, stare at it too long. I just want to demonstrate these are totally feasible calculations. Um, but something very interesting happens, which is that we can take that form that I just wrote and simplify it a bit. As again, a sum uh, over the same index set with the same weights gamma j of some lj rho lj dagger minus one half the uh, anti commutator of lj dagger lj with rho. Oops. I have a I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So the Lindbladian you said uh, the definition of the Lindbladian that you gave earlier was some n dot inverse n sort of yeah. thing, right? That, so at least that's that's one way to get it. This is what I'm doing works here for any Lindbladian, whether you derived it using the exact formalism or based on some Markovian assumption or some other way. So how how would, how would the definition that you're giving here uh, pair up with that definition? I mean, can you can you sort of derive that expression from here? Um, well, this is a special. What I'm doing. This is the more general, right? I would so say this is a, well, I, I, here. This, this is potentially more general, yes, yeah. um, because we've thrown away the description of the, of the B system, call it your environment, um, and now it's not a given that an environment will actually exist that realizes the evolution. So this is potentially more general. But given any generator, that is hermeticity preserving and trace annihilating, there will always be this decomposition um, into the canonical Hamiltonian and the canonical dissipator. And this form that I'm describing um, has the nice property that these operators LJ are traceless. So the way that they're defined, you take the original EJs and then you subtract off enough identity to make them traceless. So uh, you subtract off the trace of EJ times a matrix of trace one that's uh, proportional to the identity. And this, uh, this general form that I've highlighted is called the Lindblad form of the generator. Um, so we found the, a Lindblad form with a special property that the, what you call the jump operators, these, uh, these E's or these L's are traceless. And so if you have the canonical dissipator, then you can find traceless jump operators. And traceless jump operators, which if we, if we go back to the example that I, I started with, um, amplitude damp damping, the jump operators are precisely, in this case, the annihilation operators for this harmonic oscillator. Um, so you're really the things that jump from one energy level to another. And those are traceless as you, uh, yeah, <laughs> could, can observe. Um, so there, if, we're, if, we, if we take this decomposition, it's compatible with uh, a Lindblad form and traceless jump operators, which is nice because in practice, people often use traceless jump operators. But there's more to say. It turns out that if you find a Lindblad form with traceless jump operators, uh, then you have necessarily found the canonical dissipator. Um, and the reason is just as follows. Um, so suppose we find some other description of our, our generator in Lindblad form with some other potential Hamiltonian uh, and some other potential dip dissipator like that. So I put tildes on. So those are, aren't the canonical ones. Um, and I want my, my dissipator, you know, it might have different coefficients, different operators, uh, different jump operators. But if the the jump operators are traceless, it's a direct calculation that when I try to project on the, onto the Hamiltonian subspace, this dissipator, I'm going to get zero. And what that means is that if I'd started with the original, uh, the original generator and I projected it, what I would get back would just be my uh, commutation with H tilde. And so 
This implies that H tilde has to be the canonical Hamiltonian. And D tilde has to be the canonical dissipator. So if you ever manage to take your, uh, your generator, uh, your Lindbladian, and write it in this Lindblad form with traceless jump operators, then you know that you have actually minimized the dissipator in any of the senses that we've described here. So you don't have to go look, you don't have to apply, this isn't a prescription that you have to go out and apply um, and is gonna be incompatible with what people actually do in practice. Now, it turns out what people do in practice, they didn't realize it, but they were uh, in many cases um, minimizing the dissipation. And so I think that's what I'm writing here. Um, Ask a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, you just derived the canonical dissipator up ahead, and yep. you can derive from there some canonical heat current or work. Uh, like, yes, you uh, can. Uh, yeah. And what's the difference with the other dissipator, like the with the other current you can derive with the other dissipator? The one that I wrote with with the tildes. Yeah. Is there any like uh, well, actually, property or? Well, in general, the, so th this statement about uniqueness tells you that you're going to get exactly the same answer. The, oh. the jump operators may not be the same. The jump operators are not unique. But if you find traceless jump operators, then you have necessarily, you know, then that uniquely fixes the dissipator and, and it is the canonical one. Um, um, and so the heat oh. current is, um, is well-defined in that okay. sense. Of course, properly interpreting that, I mean, I'll, I might say a little bit about that afterwards. That, that's not what we did in our paper. But this follow-up written by Alessandra um, Kola and Heinz Peter Brewer, they they started defining those quantities and exploring their properties. And does the definition satisfy the second law or yes. thermodynamics? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another question is like your well, job operators. Um, does this does it satisfy the second law? Um, Uh, I think I think it I think it does actually. So I, I, I'm going to say I, I think the answer is yes. Um, but we have to be a, a little bit careful here that we we did this we 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 performed an uh, we use this exact master equation yeah. um, that uh, you know has these mar you know, does not make like if you if your master equation had some Markovian assumption built into it then yes you're going to satisfy the second law. But I think that even without that um, and I would have to refer to their paper to be oh, absolutely okay. sure. John might remember. I think you, you can still prove a second law. Okay. Um, and I think that could be related to the yeah. fact that if you think about what happened in the example, yeah. um, up for as long as the exact master equation was defined, yeah. um, we were increasing entropy relative to the uh, oh. initial state. Okay. Um, but then we hit this point, uh, and then we're going to be operating in the opposite direction. Um, and so I think um, that that might be related to the fact, but I'm not sure. Um, we can let okay. John pipe in. Uh, oh. we're, I'm almost done here, so but uh, we can continue that discussion. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so as I said, if you find the traceless jump operators, your master equation is automatically in canonical form. So maybe I'll say just a few words about the the Markovian case specifically. Um, so most, as I said earlier, most of the master equations that everyone writes down come from making some Markovian assumption in some interaction with an environment. And the assumption boils down uh, to the fact that you can write the joint density operator um, at every time as a product. That's clearly not true, that interactions are gonna get, generate correlations between the environment and the system, uh, the system A that you're, that you're considering. Um, but if under the assumption that you know, the time scale for interactions of the bath is fast and the bath is sufficiently large, then you can often justify this as an, uh, as an approximation. Um, and when you do that, you can always derive an equation in Lindblad form with an additional stronger condition, which is that these coefficients sitting in front of the jump operators are non-negative. When we derive this equation, we just used the fact that the generator was hermeticity preserving. And so those coefficients were not necessarily non-negative. In fact, they were generally positive and negative. Um, and so that this, this uh, master equation written down this way is generally not the one, even in the Markovian case that we've been working with, um, at least you know, the particular form, 
Um, and so, but nonetheless, the uniqueness theorem that I just uh, I just gave before tells tells us that if you can find um, such a master equation with traceless FJs, then that is necessarily the canonical one, even though they really won't be the same uh, uh, jump operators that uh, that were appearing in the in the derivation. So there's um, there's some flexibility and non-uniqueness in the structure of the jump operators, but not in the in the form of the dissipator. So the Excuse final me. comment. Oh, may I ask a question, please? Yep. Does your equation satisfy the detailed balance equation, the condition? Does it satisfy the detailed balance uh, condition? Normally, those CJ are positive, and in order to satisfy it, such that the uh, give state gives you a, a steady solution of the master equation. Like, Right. I mean, in the exact, in this case? I think in the exact case, that's not necessarily true. Oh, okay. Because of the yeah, because of the interactions. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, that's the kind of a, the kind of thing that that breaks down in this strong coupling version uh, of thermodynamics. Okay. So uh, this all sorry. started. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, are the CJ time independent? Like, there's no time. Oh no, the, these are um, in general. Let's see. Uh, in the Markovian case, if you started with the time independent Hamiltonian, then I think you can make the CJs and the FJs time independent. But in general, in this talk, I'm just assuming they're all time dependent. Okay. Yeah. So that's what allows them to be, the fact that they're time dependent is what allows them to be non-negative and still preserve positivity. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, no, it's that in the case of the Lindbladian, uh, it's not supposed to be a completely positive map, right? As long as, uh, because you you exponentiate it to get your completely positive map, and so as long as you exponentiate ex exponentiate something that's Hermitian, then you get something that is uh, completely positive. So I'm confused. What do you mean by it's? I mean, yes, I would think I just I only care if I exponentiate it as a completely positive map. Uh, for, or, or, it, let, let me put it this way. So. Mm -hmm. um, at, in the non-Markovian case, mm -hmm. at time zero, you started off with a product state and you infinitesimally map, you, know, you had an infinitesimal completely positive trace preserving map. Um, in the non-Markovian case, at time t, the state is not a product. So you don't start off with a product state. And so you're not required to be a, you know, an infinitesimal completely positive map from time t to time t plus dt. Right. Um, yeah. So you okay. would have to define your uh, time evolution in terms of uh, in, in terms of a Dyson series sort of thing, right? Because otherwise, uh, yeah, you can do that. Actually, I'll, I'll have a few comments about that at the very end. Or I'm, I'm coming to that right now. Yeah. Um, so we were motivated originally by this paper by Egon and all, and you can ask the question from our perspective: Did they do the right thing when they ended up writing down uh, a Hamiltonian? Um, that describe the open system evolution that they were looking at. And you can use our formalism to develop a, a perturbation theory, where if you say that the, the bare Hamiltonian, H0, is just the independent time evolutions of the A and the B systems, and the actual Hamiltonian is that bare evolution plus some parameter lambda times interaction, um, then you, know, you, you, can, you can do the math. And you can figure out what does the what does the canonical Hamiltonian actually look like on the A system, and to zeroth order it's just the bare Hamiltonian. To first order in lambda, it's the kind of thing that you are probably used to seeing in first order perturbation theory. It looks like the expectation value of the perturbation in some state, um, uh, in an unperturbed state, and actually in the state at time zero in this case, so not even time evolved. But you should remember this is not a um, a scalar expectation value, but it's actually an operator acting on the A system. So we traced over B, but we're still left with an operator acting on A. Um, and it's time independent, as you'll notice, because it's the, assuming the original Hamiltonian was time independent, we have the potential, which is time independent, and we have the initial state, which is time independent. At second order Sorry, in- What is the BB here? Oh, B just means tr um, trace over A. Yeah, sorry about that. So VB is the trace of the potential over the A system. Like it's an ah. operator on A and B, and you take the trace over A. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, at second order, then you start to see the time, you know, the um, the induced time dependence in the canonical Hamiltonian uh, arising from the uh, the changing state of the of the of the B system. And I'm not going to go into any kind of detail about what that uh, what that term looks like, other than to say that it has two pieces. Um, one that I've written on the left, one that I've written on the right. Um, one part of it um, can be written without any dimensional factors. That's the this one here. Um, but one, the other one has a dimensional factor, a one over d in it. And so the derivation that I gave assumed finite dimensionality. But if we just formally said, OK, well, in an infinite dimensional system, this first term, which uh, is being suppressed by powers of one over dimension, should become negligible. Of course, that's going to depend on how you take this limit. Um, then you can compare, and actually what Agon and all did in their paper, in the case of the phi 3 scalar field theory, um, is precisely uh, what is left over from our canonical Hamiltonian. And so it seems that um, their ad hoc derivation did find what we would consider to be the, the right answer. Um, so what is there to do at this point? I would still like to find a more compelling physical justification for um, at least one of these choices of size of the dissipator. Um, I've been looking at uh, questions like asking about the time evolution of, of quantities like the purity, and, uh, and those size quantities do come up at second order. Um, and so uh, I think it might be possible to tell, uh, you know, to give a more, even more compelling physical justification. Um, to really make this work in cases of interest, um, we do have to sort out what, you know, a, or come up with a good approach to the infinite dimensional setting. And possibilities there could include, in, in, you know, in, imposing cutoffs and energy and looking at how, uh, um, and if the canonical Hamiltonian um, behaves in some well-defined way, as you take the limit as that cutoff goes to infinity, then um, we'd be in good shape, um, especially because our general answer involving traceless uh, jump operators is something that can be expressed in non, uh, without dimensional factors. And finally, while we haven't been really involved in this thermodynamic formalism up to this point, um, I think it would be potentially exciting and interesting to further develop that and apply it to some interesting examples of uh, of real physical interest that people are building. So that's the uh, that's the status of this project. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take lots of questions. And it seems like there should be some discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Time for questions. So, Mark, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, so I, I have a few questions. I the first two I think are just simple technical things. So, but in the end, you have three different principled answers, right? Uh, it, well, in principle, we had three different answers, but they all gave the same answer. So that was um, so there were these three different choices of size, which were all induced uh -huh. by inner products. And when uh -huh. you calculated the canonical Hamiltonian, they all gave the same answer. Oh, I see. Okay, even though they're different inner products. I see. I see. But somehow, when you go to when you pass to the infinite dimensional case, you're going to have to use some other data, some basically prejudices about certain states versus other states. And break this sort yeah. of, uh, yeah, this is iso yeah, th this isotropic treatment of the Hilbert space, right, right. And so, Iso yeah, I mean, you could potentially weight this by a thermal state in some way, um, but that assumes you have a Hamiltonian. Uh, that's true. So, <laughs> I mean, a, a case that's suggestive. I, I don't actually know what the right answer is, but say the harmonic oscillator example that I was talking about, where you, you were just looking at amplitude damping. Um, it's very natural to write the dissipator in terms of these annihilation operators, mm -hmm. right? The traceless jump operators. And that's a well-defined concept. I mean, not in every uh, infinite dimensional setting, but in many infinite dimensional settings. Um, and so if we can if we can get to the traceless jump operators through some, like part of the message here is it seems like getting to the traceless jump operators may actually be a pretty generic conclusion. Um, for many different notions of size that you impose. Um, and so for example, if we just imposed a finite dimensional cutoff on the harmonic oscillator Hilbert space, um, what we would find is in that, in that finite dimensional subspace, um, we'd be getting the, the traceless version or you know, the annihilation operators cut off at some fixed energy. And as we took the limit, we just get the, you know, the answer that we were looking for. And so it doesn't actually depend in a detailed way on the choice of state 
um, even just an energy cutoff would do it. And I don't know if that's true generically, but at least in that and a few other examples, it works. I see, I see. Um, I, I have a very quick, stupid technical question. Like at the end, this, um, the formula and perturbation theory that you wrote down, you emphasize that the second, the first correction is, mm -hmm. an, is an operator, this lambda trace on B, but sorry, I just don't see, why is that an operator on A? Just. Oh, um, well. VB is a operator oh, on B. Um, I think I wrote this down wrong, actually. Um, oh, that's the full V. Okay. That's probably the full V. I think right? that's the full V. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, but okay, I have one last conceptual question, then I'll let mm -hmm. other people out. But um, what, uh, does this formalism encompass? I mean, I'm very ignorant about open quantum systems, but suppose it's not. Um, coupled to another system, but rather there's some kind of measurement, like maybe weak, continuous weak measurements going on, would mm -hmm. that be encompassed? And that's what's leading to the dissipation or whatever. Would that be encompassed? Yeah, so that, that's encompassed in this formalism provided. So what you would have to do is you'd have to include the, well, there are two different versions of it. If you include uh, the state of you know, some recording device in the apparatus in, mm -hmm. in the system, right. um, then what you'll actually get is the the evolution of the joint probability of the different outcomes of the measurements and the state of the system. Um, if you don't include uh, a system recording the outcomes of the measurements, then you're going to get the uh, the operator averaged over the outcomes of those measurements. Um, right. Like if you base if yeah. you yeah. yeah. Um, but you could yeah you can handle both cases this way. But but is is it is the what you call the the Hamiltonian somehow nice or natural in if if my uh dissipation oh is yeah measurement? um so oh in that case well it well, so you either. can certainly yeah it, you, you can certainly you know, write down a hamiltonian that is implementing a measurement um you know just by coupling some degrees of freedom but the thing that you have to watch for is that if you run this for for too long um, like normally with measurement, if we're measuring continuously, we would think that there's some, some record, um, mm -hmm. that we're, yeah, at each time we get, yeah, we get some trace or something. Mm -hmm. And so well, I, that's actually also fine. Um, but you're going to get some infinite, de infinite dimensional system where you actually have to be able to record the, uh, the time series, um, as your outcome, not just have a, a fixed system that you're interacting with. So the, the system you interact with varies as a function of time. Um, but there's no... There's no in principle problem with doing that in this formalism. Okay, thanks. Jonathan, do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, maybe some of them are more appropriate for um, coffee, um, but maybe maybe one is: Do you have? Can you give some intuition as to why the minimizing the dissipator leaves you with the traceless, um, the, tra the canonical form? Like why that's. Um, not yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I, I don't know that I have great intuition for. It. I mean, it's, it's not a hard calculation. Right. Um, John is on the call. He may have more intuition for for why it works. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I mean, it, it's sort of like one thing you can say is that you know, there's this sort of transformation that you did. Um, well, I don't want to call it a transformation. It's not the way you presented it here. But if you scroll up to where you simplified the Lin Lindblad form and you wrote um, LJ equals EJ minus trace. Yeah, if you look at that middle equation, that's L equals E minus trace. It, you can sort of, I mean, this isn't a, a, an intuitive answer, but other ways of writing this in Lindblad form could be thought of as subtracting different amounts of trace out of LJ. Like if you were to subtract, you know, five times the identity operator instead of trace EJ over D, mm -hmm. you would get a different Lindblad form. It wouldn't have traceless jump operators and it, had a, it would have a different Hamiltonian. So, it, you know, this is all but very, very trivial heuristic. Ambiguity, but, it? Uh, no, because that does change the Hamiltonian. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, but there's more freedom than that. There is more freedom than that. Yeah, 
yeah. in the non-Markovian case, yeah. In the Markovian mm -hmm. case, that's the only freedom you yeah. have. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's preferred by symmetry. So of course it's canonical. <laughs> <laughs> I w yeah, I wouldn't have guessed it a priori. And, and then I guess the other question, which is, I guess, maybe slightly flowing from that, which is, I guess, it was, are there like some physical principles that you would put to this? Like, I guess this seems like a very nice canonical definition. Well, this seems like a very nice definition in the sense that you get, it's nice that it, that what arises is that you minimize the dissipator and then you also get that it's the traceless um, um, decomposition. So that seems very nice, but I guess it's hard to know you know, you, you can call it canonical, but someone could come up with another one, and it's hard to know what you would choose in the end. And I guess it depends a little bit on, like you gave the motivation in terms of some papers, but it's hard to know what the what the principles are that you would use. And I guess it's a little bit why I was suggesting like maybe just the Limbladian itself, although it's a bit a boring suggestion, um, it's conserved and it generates time evolution. So that seems like a net, that's like, in some sense, the best definition of energy you might hope for. Um, so you, would just, you would just say that energy is um, is a super operator valued thing as opposed to just a well no like I guess I would the take, energy I would, is the is the generator well I would take the like you know how you can you can you can split it you can have it you can write it in terms of doubling the, the degrees of freedom so you have an a and a b system and so you can write that the energy is that as an interaction Hamiltonian in some sense so that mm -hmm. that looks like the generator I'm not sure about it I haven't thought about the non-Markovian case, but like, um, or the Markovian case, sorry, but the, um, you know, it, it, it generates the evolution and it's, it's an interaction Hamiltonian. So it has, a, I don't know how to interpret it. It has no interpretate. Well, I don't know how to interpret it, but <laughs> um, I guess the question I'm asking is, are, are there principles, what, what, what are your principles for deciding that something is canonical? Right, well, I think, at the end of the day, like say, at least in the case of this quantum thermodynamics, which I think neither John nor I are, are really experts on, but we're interested in learning more about it. If you can construct an internally consistent theory where the natural quantity that you write down for, um, for heat dissipation does correspond in some way to um, changes of energy of the bath, right? Stuff like that. Um, then I think you, you can declare that um, yeah, some level of success, right? That because the, the the end goal is to have to have a useful theory that you can reason with, um, and that was a defect of at least I don't know if it's a universal defect. I haven't read all all the quantum thermodynamics strong coupling papers, but at least some of them they, they didn't make any sense, right? That they came they write down one definition of the energy, and then you know for speaking about the bath, they were using incon inconsistent definitions. So like the 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 structure just didn't actually hold together, um, and so. If you can make the structure hold together this way, um, then I think that would be that would be justification. Um, and the and then the the in, this would essentially just be intuition as to how you chosen your Hamiltonian that you that you you wanted to say well, um, in terms of describing open system evolution again I, I, this is what I just what I said before um, you want. A, you want as much of the evolution to be unitary as possible. Um, and artificially blowing up the size of your Hamiltonian by simultaneously blowing up the size of your dissipator, it, you know, which you can do, um, is clearly cheating. And so you want to constrain that in some way. Like, so how do you, uh, effective, you know, effectively talk about separating um, Hamiltonian evolution and dissipative evolution? And this kind of inner product setup is, you know, is, is a natural way to do it. Especially if uh, I, I was alluding to before, I think, but I'm not sure that we'll be able to actually interpret the you know, at least one of these norms in terms of some some rate of change of some physically relevant entropic type quantity. Um, and if we can do that, uh, then that would you know give a, a, a further justification. Sorry, I have a question. So. From the viewpoint of entropy production, so this your special, I mean, beautiful mass, this decomposition helps us to calculate expression maybe more efficiently. Does, um, 
Yeah, yeah, so you, the, you really pick up the most important part of this I mean, entropy producing. Yeah, exactly. So the um, the Hamiltonian part does not generate any entropy. Um, yeah. And the dissipative part is kind of the minimal object that you need to specify in, in, in order to um, you know, um, characterize the entropy production um, in this system. That, that's true. Uh, so, but it's possible that there is an ambiguity we can separate in different ways between dissipation and the Hamiltonian part, and you pick up a very nice choice of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the actual rate of entropy production is not going to depend on this separation, um, but, the, but this separation does allow you to identify the part that is going to be responsible for the yeah, yeah, entropy yeah, yeah. production, yeah, in an unambiguous way. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. And it's state independent. It's state independent, yeah. I mean, it depends on the uh, on the initial state of the bath, you know, of the B system, but that's that's the only sense in which uh, yes, state, uh, state dependent. Yeah. Thank you very much. So yeah, you're welcome. Any other urgent question? I have a question. Is your final Hamiltonian Hermitian? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that was the, the definition of this Hamiltonian subspace. We, we definitely restricted to talking about uh, commuting with Hermitian Hamiltonians. That was part of the definition. I, I may have failed to mention it. Like we really, well, we really want to look at the part that is generating unitary evolution and then everything else is, uh, is you know, we want to think of that as dissipation. But in a dissipative Hamiltonian, uh, is, is, the, is the Hamiltonian uh, isn't the dissipation term supposed to mess with the unitary evolution or something? Because yeah, so I mean, there, there is a, a formalism where you you, know, you you can think of Hamiltonians that are non-Hermitian, and then there will be some real exponential evolution, which can be uh, uh, identified, say, with like some decay of some quantity or something. But yeah. I think that might be a little bit more of a phenomenological. Uh, description of the system rather than um, a principled one. Like what, what we've done here, um, in general, when you trace over some degrees of freedom, you get a mixed state um, on the system uh, on the degrees of freedom that are left, and we're and we're describing the evolution of those degrees of freedom um, directly. Like the like the formalism of you. Like if you were to use a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, you're still always going to take pure states to pure states. Um, which is not actually what happens uh, in open system evolution. I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, you initially started out by motivating your uh, your analysis by saying that you want to derive the uh, the Lindblad claim that the uh, Lindblad operator is n in n dot inverse. Uh, sorry, n in n inverse n dot, right? Well, actually, that I was that was just ex, um, pedag uh, intended to be pedagogical. I wasn't claiming to derive that. That's a yeah, a, a, an old fact. But does it does your final analysis square with this expression? That that's my question. Oh yeah, um, yeah. The final analysis is completely consistent with this. Like basically, this analysis, all it did, it, it said. It demonstrated that this operator LT would exist. You know, that, that you could describe that there was a linear differential equation for the density operator, which a priori was not completely obvious. Um, and then I just work with that that operator. Um, and I'm uh, from then on, I'm kind of agnostic as to where the operator came from. You got an LT, but is it of the form in in nt dot uh, nt inverse? Uh, it, it need not be. Uh, if it is of that form, then everything that I said is true. And even if it's not of that form, everything that I said is true. But isn't this the general form? Isn't this the most general form? This is so the general the, form in the exact I, uh, case. Yeah, go ahead, John. So nt dot nt inverse is not a useful form for the master equation. So, you know, what Patrick showed us is that Yes, you can write, you know, this nt dot nt inverse 
is a particular operator LT, a particular super operator LT that generates a linear differential equation for a density matrix time evolution. But then the rest of everything else that Patrick has told us is about analyzing that operator LT. Once we start doing that, we no longer care that it can be written in the form NT dot times NT inverse. We care about Hamiltonian decompositions of it. We care about dissipative decompositions of it. The way that we got to that operator in the first place is not important. But the way you got to the operator in the first place was the most general sort of argument that he gave, right? It was it was a it was a very general sort of argument that uh, mm -hmm. the row A is kind of uh, the the row A T is just N T times row A zero. It just followed from there, and that that's a sort of generic argument, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so it, it's a very generic whatever. argument. The like. The you can think about what one usually wants to do in analysis of open quantum systems. There are some degrees of freedom that you want to ignore, and so you want to have a, a, a complete description of what happens to the A system without any reference to the B system. That that's usually kind of what you what you want to achieve, or with minimal references to the B system. And so, the the point of this procedure was to eliminate references to B and be left with an equation only in terms of the A degrees of freedom. You could ask the question, given an L, can you manually construct a B system uh, on which there's a Hamiltonian uh, such that LT arises uh, as the, you know, when you ignore the B degrees of freedom. Like you could ask about that, um, call it some dilation of this, uh, of this generator. And I think people have studied that. We, we didn't study that at all, but it's a, it's a legitimate question to ask. You know, given, given one of these Ls, can you construct um, uh, a B system for which um, you know, there'd be an NT, an NT operator and a Hamiltonian and so forth? But that, that's a different question. Okay, so I think it's a good time to move on to the next talk. So let's post on further discussion in this coffee break after next talk. So let us thank the Patrick again for oh, great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you very much. So Nakata san, could you share your slide? Ah, sorry, maybe yeah, sure. I should do uh, uh, yeah, you oh. um, uh, not, can you hear me? Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I, I great. Should, you know, oh wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, uh, wait a moment. Um yes. So can you see the